Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Jeff Yan. In this episode, you will hear part one of my conversation with Natalie McKnight from Boston University. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. Today we have Natalie McKnight uh, from uh, Boston University. She is the Dean and Professor at the College of General Studies, CGS. Uh, Welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm, uh, happy to be here and happy to be seeing you and talking to you after a long time. That's right. I think that uh, we we met pretty early on. I want to say mm. it must be, it might be before 2010. I think it was 2008 or nine. Yeah. I couldn't quite be precise, but yeah, you were really just launching. I mean, in my mind, you were just launching. Maybe you were launching earlier than that, but you were still in Rhode Island mm-hmm. and you came up to give a talk at my college about e-portfolios. You were dynamic. You know, we were <laughs> transfixed. We thought, well, this is... I mean, those of us who are into that kind of thing, we thought this this is something we need to have. And that was even before we were talking about assessment, which is something we can get to later. But um, yeah, yeah. So that actually, since we launched our e-portfolio project in 2009, it had to have been 2008, which is 13 years ago. (laughs) I know. It's been a long time. We still look the Um, same, though. It's a good thing it's a podcast. (laughs) People won't be able to judge that. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Well, we don't we don't put a before after photos. We we just Good. do the now. <laughs> don't, don't scare me. Um, the uh, I I remember uh, being invited by Dean Linda Wells, who was the previous dean for mm-hmm. for College of General Studies at BU, mm-hmm. um, and uh, to um, to uh, present there. And I met you and many of the dear colleagues at uh, BU. You, you all have been doing amazing work this last decade, really. And the, the, the oh. people have all gone to do different amazing things. You've become, you became the dean. Um, how many years ago now have you, have you been the dean? I've been dean uh, eight years, yeah. almost exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, Linda, Linda retired. Mm-hmm. Uh, great colleague, great mentor toward, uh, to me. And she really did launch us on our e-portfolio use. So I think she was pretty prescient in kind of moving us in that direction. Mm-hmm. And I've been very happy to grow our program. And, uh, and yeah, the program really has grown. I mean, as, as, as Digication has grown, um, our use of e-portfolios has grown and has really helped us, again, in addition to assessment, but it really has helped us to kind of um, identify and hone uh, who we are as a college yeah. uh, and, and, and really articulate and and visualize for others the value of our college so that's that's been tremendous it it wasn't even something i think we knew we needed to do and now having done it i can't imagine not having done it <laughs> wow that's uh, that's 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 uh, that's good to hear now as a dean um you must also now be or having you know been dean for the last eight years you you also Oh, like the the person who's really defining some of those values and, and the culture at your mm-hmm. college. Um, how do you how do you do that? That's that's a that's a really big job. It, it is a big job. Um, I would say that's the joy part of the job, though, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've been at College of General Studies at Boston University for thirty one years, a uh, long time, and um, as a rhetoric professor, humanities professor, chair of humanities, and associate dean, and then dean. And and when you're in a place like that, and, and you come to love it, I love this college. I believe in it. Um, but you you form ideas about well, what can we do better? Um, what should we change? If you're really invested in the whole community and not just your your own little piece of it, right? You, you have ideas. So, so being Dean, the best part of being Dean is being able to enact some of those ideas and uh, and then derive some of the best ideas from the community and then enact them and, and help to hone and define that culture, which again is, you know, we talk a lot about culture now these days. And, and I think all all colleges, universities, businesses, corporations, everyone's talking about culture. But 10 years ago, when we talked about culture, it was, 
it was when we were talking about our humanities course, you know, and, and the cultures we studied from the past, we weren't talking about defining our culture. And, and that has become so much more important in, in so many ways, both in terms of just doing what you do to the best of your ability, which of course everybody wants to do. You can't really do that if you haven't articulated your culture. Um, and then, and then also figuring how to improve on that. Um, but also, you, you know, we, we're in the business of recruiting new students, right? We're in the business of recruiting grant money and donations from, from alumni and parents, et cetera. You really need to define your culture to do that too. So it's been really interesting to have started from a place where culture meant something that we talk about in our classes that's in the past to, and we still do that, of course, to, to being in this place where we are always defining and improving our culture and understanding how key that is in, in bringing together all of our constituencies, you know, students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, um, it, it's all part of the whole enterprise. And that, that what I just said, probably long-winded, sorry. Uh, I'm glad you have an editor That's okay. working on this. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it is kind of staggering for me to think about how much those ideas about culture have evolved over the last 10 years. And education has been a part of that because um, well, you know, you you created it, but um, in getting our our students to use education to kind of reflect on their learning and to archive what they've done, and then and using it to assess how students have progressed in our program, and then to assess how changes we've made in our program have worked or not worked, you know, it's just helped us see all of that. And, um, and and learn from it in, in ways that I, I don't know if we could have we could have done it with uh, without the education. So I know this is not supposed to be a commercial. Jeff did not pay me just to say that. <laughs> I'm doing this pro bono. I wouldn't know what to pay you. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't know what to pay me. Um, I wouldn't know what to ask. <laughs> um, so yeah, Natalie, the, there is something about. I mean, I think that's a really. Uh, it's really a astute point, and it's something that you. It's because you've been in it for so long that you get to see those that cycle. You know, like you were mm -hmm. saying, it takes a, a certain, almost, you know, sort of arc, um, yes. for you to then be able to come back and say, "Well, this is how we can see the changes, and this is how mm -hmm. we use, you know, these." assessment tools or feedback or just being able to see what students are doing in order for us mm -hmm. to reflect as an organization. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, um, it's not something that you get to be able to experience year one or year, or even year three, <laughs> at least not in a, such an obvious way, you know? No, no, that's so yeah. true. And, 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 and when you're, you know, in the classroom every day and let's say you have 80, mm -hmm. 90 students, right. And, and, and that's a wonderful, I mean, I love teaching. I love teaching. But when you're doing that, it's hard to pull back and see the big, big picture. It's almost impossible to. It's only when you start maybe taking on some of the administrative rules, roles, um, which it's not for everybody, that's for sure. But then you kind of, and, and you still teach, but then you could kind of be in the classroom, but then you can kind of hover a little bit above those classroom mm -hmm. duties and kind of see the the whole organization and what are you trying to do besides just make this next class work because those first few years of teaching that's what you do and I just want this class to work and then I want this <laughs> semester to work and I want to get my grades in it's all it's just like you know putting one fire out at a time um, but then after a few years you can start thinking about the whole organization and the whole experience of being a student and uh, of being a faculty member too well, you know, that's de definitely um, really evident in in your work because you came from being a professor and 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 teaching in the classroom and still doing that, um, sort of never forgetting or having, you know, had your other roles dilute your your love for teaching and 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 there is also something that I feel like is pretty special at CGS, which is its pedagogy itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I want to tell people who 
might be listening and or watching who don't know what a College of General Studies does. You know, pretend that right. we are on. <laughs> you're not on. You're not on like a you know a New York Times interview right now. But but pretend that you are, and people who are, yeah. you know, who 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 are listening to this may may have gone to college who didn't have this general studies thing. What is it? Okay, I, I will give it my my two minute, hopefully two minute uh, elevator talk. Um, so College of General Studies is a two year general education program within Boston University. So students come in and they do most of their general education credits with us as kind of typical first year, second year courses in college. And while they're with us, they're also starting to work toward a major in one of the other you know, 16 undergraduate colleges at Boston University. So they're working on gen ed, they're starting to work on their major. I think what makes us particularly um, uh, distinct and I think impactful is that we bring students in and we put them on a team. So a team of maybe 80 students shares the same three faculty in humanities, rhetoric and social science in the freshman year and three fact faculty in humanities, social science and natural sciences in, in the sophomore year. And they have those faculty for two two semesters. So they're on a team, two semesters, they've te the faculty really get to know the students, the students really get to know the faculty. And then because the faculty have a shared group of students, the faculty meet on that team, they meet once a week to talk about what's happening in their courses. And so that they can be making interdisciplinary connections among their courses. Sometimes just in a real ad hoc way, let's say, Jeff, you were teaching social science and you were talking about World War One. you're introducing what what led us, uh, you know, the world into World War One. And I'm teaching humanities. Well, I, I would have known because I'm on a team with you that you're going to be talking about that. So I'd line up my syllabus. So I'd be talking about World War One poets who were in the trenches writing sonnets and uh, films that were filmed during World War I so that they get the kind of the um, artistic perspective on the war. And then in rhetoric, which is a writing, argumentation, research class, they might be looking at World War I propaganda posters and how did mm -hmm. people uh, hone those posters to persuade others to um, enlist in a, in a war that was basically decimating an entire generation. So so instead of just like talking about World War I and social science and maybe talking about medieval poetry and humanities, maybe talking about, um, I don't know, um, verb modifiers in rhetoric. <laughs> You have this kind of holistic perspective, this interdisciplinary perspective on a subject, which really helps students get to uh, to have a, a, a deeper, richer understanding of a point in time and, and kind of human interactions. And I think it helps them remember it too, because every course is reinforcing the other course. And then of course, our um, we have all of our students set up ePortfolio sites before they even start with us. So they have tabs for each of their courses. They can see how they're doing in each course in their, in their relates. And then we give them joint paper assignments where they have to draw from all three courses and pull that material together in some kind of reading, understanding of their own. And it's not just a paper. So we, we might have them do a, uh, some, a photo journal uh, essay or a, um, a podcast. We actually have students do podcasts mm -hmm. now and things like that. So it could be much more, um, uh, technological than a standard old paper, or it could be a paper, mm -hmm. but so we, we really believe that team system, um, is, is best for learning and it's best socially too, because students have shared classes with other students. They get to know one another well. And again, I, as I said, the faculty get to know them. And so it's like socially and intellectually cohesive and, and, and I love it. I believe in it. And you know, that something <laughs> that I, yeah, it does. And I, I love it too. And one of the things that I also um, think is special is that it it feels like that it's something that is customized to the person, and it it it, mm -hmm. it it feels like that you are able to get something that would have worked in a really you know sort of individually customized scale, except that you're working at a huge scale. Um, huge scale. We're not yeah. small. We have six hundred students coming in every year. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, looks like seven hundred this year. So mm -hmm. twelve to thirteen hundred students. But you're absolutely right. You put your finger right on it. Yeah. It's it's one it's one of the things I love is because even though we it, you know the team is a great community it's this great impactful um, approach to to learning but also 
within these kind of required gen ed courses, we uh, many of the faculty, including me, pretty much every semester, provide directed studies. So let's say, Jeff, you were in my humanities class, and I found out that you're really interested in, well, the digital revolution, right? And um, and I'm interested in poetry. And you say, I want to do, I want to do a directed study on how the digital revolution has shaped the arts. Then you and I could craft like a two credit or four credit, just one-on-one -on -one study where we would just look into that together. I would, I'd help you put together a syllabus. We'd work maybe once, once a week, once every two weeks. And at the end of the semester, in addition to a course towards your major and the gen ed courses you're taking at CGS, you would have this two to four credit independent study mm -hmm. as a freshman or, or a sophomore. That's amazing. In an area that's amazing. precisely what you're interested in and, and something I'm interested in too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in addition to those directed studies, and I've probably done maybe three dozen of them at least um, over the mm -hmm. years, oh, actually probably more. We also now um, have uh, uh, maybe about 50 paid undergraduate research projects a year too, so that if a student wow. needs to, wants to earn some money, and there's a faculty member who's doing research in an area that they're interested in pursuing, we pair them up. Student helps the faculty member in their mm -hmm. research area, which is help, you know, nice help for the faculty member. Student mm -hmm. learns all kinds of interesting, specific kind of high level stuff about research in that discipline and makes $2,000 a semester. So looks great in a resume, helps with college expenses, uh, helps out the faculty. Mm -hmm. So that's something we've grown from one or two projects a year to 50 a year. And But to your point, that is really like a bespoke education, isn't it? Even though we, we have yeah. these required courses, yeah. we have all of these ways, in addition to just right. obviously office hours, you know, where you can can have it really individualized. And um, and that's really, I think, where education well, happens the best. Yeah, I think, I think in many ways, that's sort of like the secret, the secret sauce at BU. You know, BU is a giant school. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I oftentimes think about really large universities like BU as being, well, am I just a, a small number, you know, in this huge, you know, body of mm -hmm. water? Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's, uh, you, you know, you, you know, do you feel like you get lost? And I think in some, some places you do. Uh, but I think that, you know, like a program like this, um, first of all, you have those, 79 students in your, in your yeah. group that becomes sort of, you know, the people that you, 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 you becomes your real cohort, your, your you know, close colleagues. Yeah. Uh, but I, I also find that there is this maybe going further than just the idea of like making the, 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 the connections between those three different faculty members because they're talking to each mm -hmm. other and, and integrating the curriculum. I think there is a, um, uh, the, the experience having having done something integrative in your life is a mm -hmm. is an experience that many students don't ex get to do when they were younger or when they were just coming from high school or even in in the, in life in the world. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you might have some you know older students coming in, for example, who who may not have all of that you know sort of figured out, and mm -hmm. that experience to me is in and of itself a um, provide a, a, a learning experience that allows you to realize that when things in your life are looked at in an integrative way, you can make them all work together. And they 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 are they are, you know, they're they they they're there to strengthen the other parts. Um, and that's a that's a that's an amazing bit of experience that I was going to say it's hard to manufacture, but you have done it, you know? <laughs> we have done it, but yeah. it, is, it would be hard to impose our model yeah. on a kind of more traditionally organized college mm -hmm. because, you know, I think faculty are sometimes tend to be a bit lone ranger-ish, mm -hmm. right? You know, they just kind of want to do their own thing mm -hmm. and and we're not designed that way we never have been so and so some faculty don't work out so well but the ones who we keep who stay <laughs> around and they stay around for decades my, myself included they really love it and they love it uh, precisely for what you for what you just said Jeff you know, again you put your finger right on it you know we aren't just showing how you could understand like World War One better if you look at it mm -hmm. in an interdisciplinary manner we are trying to train the students to think 
about everything in their life in an interdisciplinary manner, because I do think that's key to being a good critical thinker. We, we you know, throw that phrase around a lot. Oh, we're training people to be a good critical yeah. thinker. But then, you know, what does that actually mean? I think for me, one of the things it means is that, you know, whenever you are, you know, going into a situation, whether it is um, trying to Im- improve voting in your neighborhood uh, or it's uh, trying to fight, you um, uh, a gas pipeline that's going to cut right by the elementary school or, you know, tr- trying to fight, uh, you know, nuclear armaments on a global scale. Wh- whatever you are trying to engage in, change, problem solve about, uh, you really need to pull from many, many different disciplines and many, many different perspectives and integrate them. Um, it's the key to critical thinking. It's the key to problem solving. And we do it again and again in our program because it's so valuable and because we can because of the team system. But I, I wanted to add um, mm-hmm. just this last year during COVID, uh, we created um, uh, an interdis- uh, a minor in interdisciplinary studies. So so CGS is no longer just a two-year program within right. BU. We have a four, four-year four degree that just, for students who love that integrative learning, they can do it in six more courses. Actually, it's four more because two of our required courses count for the first two of the six. Uh, and then they would have a minor in interdisciplinary studies to go, that's really focused on problem solving in multiple different venues. And they could have that with any major, which I think is a great pairing with any major because I know I, I talk to employees, sorry, employers all the time and, you know, what are they looking for? And they want people who can problem solve and they want people who can communicate and they want people who can can do that kind of integrative. And you you work on teams, you 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 know, you must you must see it, you must create these kind of um, teams of people who are doing yeah. kind of that that integrative problem solving, mm-hmm. creation, etc. It is it is so incredibly important these days and and it actually goes back to a little bit of your early part about culture as well and we we I mean I think these days we look for sort of a a real mesh between skills and culture fit. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like that you, many businesses used to probably care a lot about the skills and what's on a diploma and uh-huh. and the culture part is sort of well some disciplines do care about it if you happen to be that kind of person or that kind of leader or that kind of you know a supervisor uh, but you can also kind of decide not to care about it and make it work just by forcing uh-huh. people to do, do it the way you uh-huh. want right and uh-huh. i think that uh-huh. today it's really different and i would I would go as far as to say that sort of the current generation of students, um, there is an even bigger sort of sort of motivation that that is a lot different from just, you know, hey, I just need to get a job and oh, I just need to mm-hmm. pay, you know, for my expenses on rent or food. Um, they, mm-hmm. they, they kind of, there's, there's a, a growing number of students that I meet every day that basically said, I want, I want to be someone useful and contribute to the world. I want to make a dent. You know, I don't want to mm-hmm. just do a job, which is different, mm-hmm. honestly, from when I was um, a student. I think, I think we just want to make money and, yeah. you know, get a job that, that once you have that, then you, you, you find happiness somehow otherwise. But I think the yes. students today are a little bit, I don't know what caused it, but I think it's, they're just a little wiser. They make decisions in, um, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit differently. Um, do you see that as a as a dean at a, at a undergraduate uh, program? Yes, absolutely. I see it every year. Um, I've been seeing it for a few years. I think the pandemic has escalated it. You know, I, I mean, nothing like a global crisis to make people. Uh, reflect on their values. And, and so students do definitely want a job that has purpose and meaning. And they, they want to feel like they, whatever they're doing would have purpose and meaning. And that's kind of a tough call in some jobs, right? But, but if, but if a, a business or a college or whatever, an entity has created a culture that does value every member and is really good at demonstrating that value and articulating 
the larger purpose and the importance of that purpose than even somebody who has a kind of entry-level job that could seem maybe kind of soulless, purposeless. If a company has defined the job, if the, the culture well enough, even an entry-level person should feel valued and like they're contributing to something larger than themselves. And I think that's the key. Students really want to contribute to something larger than themselves. And it's not just the students. It's not just the 18, 19 year olds coming in now. I mean, it's yeah. Grown-ups, it's you know what do we? It's called the Great Resignation right now. We've got swarms of people all over the country just walking away from high-paying jobs, and I'm not just talking about you know wait staff. I mean, we could see why somebody is a tough wait. Waiting is tough. I've done it. Sure. That's hard, back-breaking work, and you don't make much money. So I think anybody should be able to understand why some somebody might walk away from that job. But people walking away from jobs that pay well, that have benefits, but they don't have the culture they don't feel like it's purposeful that it's drawing from their innate gifts and it's really interesting to watch this and see how it's going to kind of to to shake down but yeah we're we're in a an enormous yeah. work revolution right now but i think it's really exciting yeah. i think it's exciting to see people wanting that and wanting to contribute i just hope uh, there's enough wisdom out there in articulating how much even um, an entry-level position can have a powerful impact on uh, absolutely you know on everybody in mm -hmm. in you know everybody that they encounter because that's that's a mm -hmm. big part of it too it is and going back to you know how did the people how do how do students get to almost be wiser like then i kept comparing to when i i i really felt like that when i i was you know going to college that was i don't know like if you are a nice person you think about those things but yeah you kind of <laughs> no one expected you to and yeah. and um and in fact is you know it's the phrase it's just business right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you you do what you got to do, right? It's mm -hmm. and and the students today, they don't they don't think that they don't they don't do what they got to do. They they do what they think is 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 useful that that they want to do. And and uh, and I can't help but think that it is a result of the space that you, um, at least at BU, have created for the students for them to reflect. For them to make connections, because to me, when I kind of drill back down, like thinking about the sort of, you know, how do they, how do they make all these connections? How do they, how do they start to think? Like you were saying, World War One poetry, you know, yeah. the rhetoric. But then, how do they go from there to? Well, this is what I'm going to do to solve current contemporary issues in in society, right? Because we know a lot of people are doing that today. And mm -hmm. and they have to make that connection because they were given the space to to reflect and and to think deeply about those things. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I love to take some credit for it. I, I will say that in, in addition to having regular reflections and the interdisciplinary teaching in the program, we do have a capstone project at the end of the second year that asks students. Uh, to draw from everything they've learned and solve a real world problem. Mm -hmm. And faculty come up with a syllabus that has maybe 20 different real world uh, issues. Some of them could be local, some of them could be global. And then the students pick which one they want to work on. And then they have to work in teams, small groups, like, you know, five or six, use research, use everything they've learned, and not just talk about the problem, but pose a viable real world solution. And then defend it in an oral presentation. And of course, we use our uh, e-portfolios all the time throughout that process so that every individual can log on, like a, a, just keep a log of their research, their work, mm -hmm. in addition to the group posting the whole paper. And that kind of solves some of the problems that you get in group work, right? You know, sometimes some people contribute more, right. some people don't contribute much at all. You get these he said, she said situation mm -hmm. so so the, again the electronic portfolio has been great for that but yeah I, th I think it's really important in in uh higher ed to have these q 
key moments and not just at the end of four years, you know, ideally I'd say in the middle and then at the end, at least where you're asking students, okay, stop, think about what you've learned and let's try out. How would you address um, uh, hunger in Boston? You know, how would you address bike safety? <laughs> and and just get them to, to right. kind of, it's, you know, those, those wheels, I mean, going from academia to like actual real world problem solving, the, you got to get that mechanism working early so it's not too creaky. <laughs> and, but once right, you get them right. thinking that way, they realize, oh, okay, I know how to research. I know how to interview people. I, um, I have ideas. Once you read enough, then you start thinking about it and you, you're in a group. Mm -hmm. So you throw ideas around just like you would in some, like a brainstorming session at some, um, you know, startup. Uh, and then you realize, oh my gosh, I can do this. And the, and the beauty is, okay, right. so you can do this. And now you know how to do it. And it just builds such confidence. Because I think one of the things that can happen, if your education is too esoteric the entire way through, you come out and then you see these real world problems and it's just overwhelming. Like, oh my God, well, how do I go from what I've studied to, to dealing yeah. with this? Or even just on a job, forget dealing with real world problems. I mean, you, let's say... Uh, you go out to Hollywood and you're trying to, you know, work on a film set and you've studied certain things, but somebody, somebody says, okay, can you be script boy? And you're like, okay, what's script boy? I don't know. What is that? <laughs> and I've had students who say uh, that literally who had that scenario, went out, did an internship, got a job, uh, working for Steven Spielberg, actually, right after their internship in LA and was asked to be script boy, had no idea what that meant went back, researched it, talked to people, um, took the job, took the job right away. Oh yeah, I'll do that. And then went back and figured out what the job was and then figured out how he do it. And he said the whole time I was panicked, but he said, if I could do capstone, I could do this. <laughs> and he did. I hear, I hear that from a lot of the time what, is that. Right. Yeah. And it's, 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 it is exactly the type of, education model that is so important because it's not about teaching them the exact set of you know sort of content knowledge it's about mm -hmm. giving them the methodologies so that they can apply to anything in the world yep. um yep. you know like unless you were in public health or in certain aspects of you know sort of health you know uh, 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 fields of uh, medicine um Perhaps up until this last year, you don't think a lot about public health. You don't think that much mm -hmm. about, you know, um, you know, sort of what happens in a pandemic situation, right? Mm -hmm. And can you imagine how many, how many people and how 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 many people could have been help more helpful if they had had that experience, you know? And I think that the students that go mm -hmm. through this capstone project has the experience and has the confidence that they built in themselves. It says, I know how to string things together because mm -hmm. I've done it. I've done, I've strung mm -hmm. things together that didn't seem to make sense in the beginning or they didn't seem mm -hmm. to make connections, but I put them together. Right. And I think that those are, that's an experience that I almost feel like it used to be saved for, you know, it almost feel like that if you were trained to be on the ladder to become a leader, you might get some of those training right. sort of reserved right. for the selected few, you know? Right, um, right. But it doesn't have to be like that. Right, exactly. Everyone needs it because everyone is going to need it in their civic lives and in their professional lives. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't, uh, as you know, pe people don't tend to do what I did and that is get a job in one place and stay there for 31 years. That's very, very rare. People are shifting every two, three years. So they're constantly going to have to be landing in new places, new, new, new expectations, new jobs, you know, new colleagues, new group expectations, new kind of collaboration challenges. They're just constantly going to have to be able to figure things out on their own. And nobody's going to hand them a manual. Nobody handed me a manual to be dean. There is no manual for being dean. There's a lot of stuff you just figure out as you go along. And and entrepreneurs are like that, of course, right? They're they're figuring things out and they're and and they're figuring out what it is and then they're creating what they want. Right. At the same time, it's just a lot of problem solving and, and creative activity and collaboration. I don't need to tell you, you've done all that. This concludes part one of our conversation with Natalie McKnight from Boston University. 
hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative e-portfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. This episode was produced by Drew Albanicius. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching.